Hey, what's up guys? My name is Coco from High Street and I wanna welcome you to Church Online. Our mission at High Street is to love God, serve people and reach the world. We hope you enjoy today's content. Let me ask you a question to get us started today. Have you ever wondered about God's calling on your life? Have you ever wondered about what it is exactly that you should be doing with your life? Have you wondered if maybe God's calling on your life is changing? Have you wondered if maybe God's calling was something that you missed? Most of us as Christians wonder about these questions. And you know, while we all do have individual callings that come to us, there's a general calling of God that's revealed to us in the scriptures. And it's as we respond to that general calling that we see in the Bible that we discover that particular calling for ourselves. And so I want to explore this idea of the general call of God, and I want to encourage us all, myself included, to answer that call today with a yes. So, to begin this investigation of the general call of God, I want to look at that pattern that we see, the pattern of God's call, in one of the earliest stories of a person being called for God's purposes, and you'll find that in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. If you'd like to turn there or pull it up on your phones, we'll also have it on the screen, of course. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 2, and we're looking at the calling of Abram, who was later known as Abraham. Here's what we read there. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 4, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Lot, his nephew, went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So here we see an early example of someone who heeded God's call. But to understand this call in its context, I want us to cast our minds back to the dim reaches of the distant past and think about the ancient world for a second. Now most of us, myself included, don't know much about the ancient world, but what we probably do remember from our school days is this. The ancient world is a story of nations battling nations. Nations duking it out with each other. You've got some nations that are formed just to preserve themselves and to protect themselves from the dangerous world out there. You've got other nations that grow in power, influence, ambition, and they go out and they conquer and they take from the natural resources of the, of the people around them, they take slaves, they conquer, they want power, and they all fight it out. And into that world of nation versus nation, God steps in and he calls someone and he says, Abram, we're gonna make a different type of nation. We're gonna make a nation that's not concerned simply with self-preservation. We're gonna make a nation that's not concerned with conquering other people and with violence. We're making a nation the purpose of which is blessing. And not simply blessing immediate neighbors or blessing just the people around them, but blessing all of the nations of the earth. And notice the particular phrasing here, which I think is so perfect. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All of the lineages, all of the tribes, all the nations. Abram's called because God's working in the world and in a world where the nations are hating each other and fighting each other, he's making a new type of nation, one that's concerned with blessing. This is the pattern of the call right here. Abram is called to submit to God's leadership. He's called to step away from what's comfortable in his life. And he's called to be blessed, to be a blessing. Okay, let's fast forward now through history several centuries and let's go to the time of Jesus. Jesus, God uniquely manifested in the flesh, is starting his ministry. It's a ministry of teaching, a ministry of healing. And he's calling disciples and he's using that great two word phrase, follow me. And when he asks people to follow him, he's asking them to follow his example and follow his teachings. And Jesus is unique among teachers in that his example and his teachings are always perfectly harmonious. I hate to admit that the things that I teach, I don't always live up to. Not even close. Here or at school, where I teach. So, but with Jesus, the teachings and the example are perfectly harmonious. And so he's calling the disciples to follow him. And he's saying this, in a world where people are concerned with themselves, eaten up with fear, where people are concerned with amassing wealth, generating power and influence and exerting that over the people. In that world, I'm calling you out to follow my example of self-sacrifice and charity because we're making a new type of person in the world. That's the general call, again, 
This is the call that comes to all of us, and as we answer this call, we discover what exactly we need to be doing in our lives. So there are three implications, which I've already referenced, related to this general call to come out into the world and be a different type of person and be a blessing. And the three implications are the three points today, and here they are. The first is we must submit to God's leadership if we're going to answer this call. We've got to submit to God's leadership. Second, we must be willing to leave our comfort zones if we're going to answer this call. And third, we must bless others with our blessings if we're going to be answering this call. So first, we must submit to God's leadership. God called Abram to action. He called him to leave his home, the location he was familiar with, and go somewhere else. Jesus called his disciples to action, to follow him and to live a different type of life. And I bring this up because I want us all to understand, and this is something I've been dealing with in my own life, I would say, when we are called to submit to God's leadership, we are not being simply called to agree with God. I think in my life, a lot of times, I feel like I'm submitting to God because I agree with him. But submitting to God's leadership doesn't mean only agreement. It means action. So if you're like me, you can probably look at yourself and think, yeah, in my life, I'm I'm pretty good in some areas in taking action, and there's other areas where I'm primarily an agreeer with God, but I don't really take action. That is, I agree that you should love enemies. It would be great if people loved their enemies. That would be a really good thing. I agree. That's a good teaching. It's a different thing to take action and love your enemies than to agree. Submitting to God's leadership is not about only agreement. It's about taking action. Another thing, something y'all talked about in the young adults recently, I know. Forgiveness. It's easy to agree that forgiveness is best. We need to forgive one another. But it's hard to forgive. We've got to take action, though. And because it's hard, we need that relationship with God. We need those spiritual practices in our lives. Because through those spiritual practices, not only do we experience God's leadership, not only does he lead us through the word and through the spirit, he empowers us through spiritual practices to follow him and to actually take action. So, oftentimes, even when we have been taking action and things like that, we'll stray a little bit from this call. Maybe you're in a position in your life right now where you recognize that you're not following and taking action and submitting to God's leadership the way that you should. Well, the good news and what I want to encourage you with is this. Christ is still standing there, and he's still saying, follow me. And he'll welcome you back onto the path with open arms. You can come back and start following him again. One of my favorite passages about submitting to God's leadership and following Christ is John chapter 21. I think this is one of the best stories in the Bible. It's kind of the conclusion or the epilogue of the Gospel of John. I'll ask you to turn there. We're going to look at a passage from John chapter 21. In this chapter, Jesus, after he's been resurrected, meets his disciples by the seashore and makes them breakfast, and he has an interesting exchange with Peter. And we're going to look at that exchange with Peter, not in its entirety, but we're going to look at one section of it. And please recall that before this, a few years before this, Jesus had met Peter by the seashore, and Peter had been a fisherman, and he'd said to him, follow me. And Peter had left his profession, and he'd gone to follow Jesus. And he'd been with him through those three years, through ups and downs. And here we are again, three years later. Jesus has gone to the cross. He's died for our sins. He's been buried three days. He's resurrected, and he's going to have this exchange with Peter. We'll start in verse 18 of John 21. Verse 18, most assuredly I say to you, This is Jesus speaking to Peter. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he, Peter, would glorify God. He told Peter that when Peter was older, he was going to experience death, and he was going to experience a death where his arms were stretched out, and Peter would understand what that meant. He was going to a cross, like Jesus did, and the traditions tell us that's exactly what happened. Peter was crucified later in his life. So Jesus tells him, that's what's coming. It's not all coming up roses in the future. There's going to be difficulties. Let's see what Jesus continued to say there, continuing in verse 19. And when he, Jesus, had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. The message is the same. There are difficulties ahead for all of us. For humans on planet Earth, there's difficulties ahead. But the call is always the same. Follow Jesus. Live the Jesus life, the life of self-sacrifice, of charity, of goodness, even in the face of difficulties and death. 
And we can be assured as we respond to that call to follow him that Jesus has trod the path before us. Peter knew when he went to be crucified that his Savior had gone through the exact same thing. And he was following him, even in that difficulty. Okay, let's keep reading here in this passage. I think it gets really interesting right here. I mean, that was pretty interesting too, but this is really good. Verse 20, then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? That is a really long way of saying that Peter turned around and saw John, okay? (laughs) So he turned around and he saw John, all right? So Peter turns and he sees John. Keep reading there. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? This is why we love Peter. Peter thinks like we think, and he actually says it out loud, right? So he's thinking, okay, I know what's going to happen to me. What's going to happen to these guys? And in particular, he's wondering about John. Hey, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to John? He, 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 his mind went immediately to other people. These are some of the distractions that afflict us whenever we're attempting to follow Christ. Have you ever not been following Christ because you're focused on other people? people other than Jesus. You're envious of someone else. You think, well, why did that person get that job and why am I in this job? Why did this person get the promotion? What's happening with this person? Why did this person treat me? And we think this person, this person, this person, those people become prominent in our minds. We think about other people. The person who needs to be prominent in our mind is the leader who we should be submitting to and that's Jesus. Verse 22, Jesus said to him, if I will that he, John, remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Bring the focus back to where it's supposed to be. He was told to follow him. Peter's mind immediately goes to other people, and Jesus brings it back. You're going to be distracted by those things. All of us will be. But Jesus says, hey, the most important thing, the person you need to be thinking about is me and my example and answering the call to live the Jesus life, which is unlike the life of the world, focused on its own concerns and focused on getting power and focused on fear and so on. So, second point. In order to do these things, in order to follow Jesus with our lives, we must be willing to leave our comfort zones. When God called Abram, it says explicitly that he was called to leave his father, his father's house. He was called to leave what was comfortable and what was familiar. When Jesus called his disciples, many of them left their jobs. As I said a moment ago, Peter and other fishermen left their nets, their fishing nets, to follow Jesus. One of the most interesting of the disciples, Matthew, who was a tax collector. He left his table, it says, his table where he collected taxes from the Jewish people. He stood up and left that table, left the comfort of a job and a good income behind to follow Jesus. I'm sure that was uncomfortable for him to some degree. My family and I, we've been watching a TV show called The Chosen. I'm sure many of you have seen this show. And it's a fictionalization of many of the lives of the people that Jesus interacted with. And one of my favorite scenes in the first season is the scene of the calling of Matthew when he leaves his his table where he's collecting taxes and he goes with the disciples. And here's why. He gets up to go with the disciples. And you have to remember, a tax collector in ancient Israel is an absolute villain in the eyes of the Hebrew people. It is someone who has uh, betrayed the Hebrew people to join and be complicit with Rome and to take money from them. And they were often viewed as unscrupulous as well. They would take a little off the top. They would take some extra money for themselves. And so tax collectors were viewed very, very poorly. And so when Jesus calls Matthew, we see in this show, again, we don't know exactly how this all went down, but this scene rings very true to what we do know. When Jesus called Matthew, the disciples are kind of like, uh, what? You're calling a tax collector? Some of them are just kind of shocked and surprised. Some are appalled. And then, of course, Peter steps forward and he's like, this is unusual. This is unusual, Jesus. This is, I don't know about this. A tax collector? And so Jesus said to him, and again, we don't know if he said this or not, but it rings true to the character of Jesus and to the, to the point that he was making. Here's what he says to Peter. Peter says, this is unusual. Jesus says, get used to different. Get used to different. We're doing something different in the world. I'm calling you to something different in the world. We've got to get used to different, and different is sometimes uncomfortable. Different is very often uncomfortable, let's be honest. We're going to do something different in our lives. We're going to be a different type of person. We're going to forgive people. We're going to give away and not expect anything in return. We're going to love people who are mean to us. We're going to be uncomfortable at times, but that's the calling, to be a blessing to the people around us regardless of our fleeting discomforts in life. I'm going to share with you an anecdote. I've shared this with some of you in the past, and it's about my own discomfort, and I hope you're able to take pleasure in hearing about me being uncomfortable at one point. 
in my life. It's, usually, it's a kind of funny to see other people who are uncomfortable. We don't like it, but hopefully you'll be able to laugh at this. So <clears throat> when I was 18 going on 19, for the last couple of summers, I had been helping out with a baseball ministry we had here called 10th Inning Kids, and I would show up for about an hour every Saturday and umpire a game. Well, as the, in the spring uh, of whenever I was 18, one of the pastors came and asked if I would be willing to be a coach that year. So not just an umpire, but actually coach a team of first graders in baseball. It was coach pitch. And that involved coaching them, teaching some of them how to play, giving a devotion to them and their parents, and of course, doing practices, games, all that stuff. So he asked, and I just kind of immediately, unthinkingly said, yeah, sure, sure, no problem. And I went on my merry way. My way didn't stay merry very long because I started thinking about what I had just committed myself to. And I was 18, okay, at the time, so I'm thinking, okay, wait a second. I'm going to have to go and like, teach all these kids how to play baseball. And I'm not that great of a baseball player. I played as a kid, but I'm not that great. And I'm going to have to give devotions. I hadn't really done that before. Okay, this is, I don't know about all this. And not only that, but I had a lot going on in my life at that time related to Mario Kart primarily. <laughs> but I had a lot going on. And it wasn't, let's be fair, it wasn't only Mario Kart. Luigi's Mansion, this was the GameCube years. And so Luigi's Mansion, the ghosts aren't clearing themselves out of Luigi's Mansion. And I felt like maybe I was the person to do that. And so I had a lot going on in my life. No, really, I didn't have that much going on is the point, okay? I, wasn't, I didn't have a job that summer or anything. Didn't have much going on at all, but I was a, and continue to be to some degree, a lazy and selfish person. I'm like, I don't really want to give up all these hours of preparing a devotion and of going to practices early and leaving late and going to the games and all this stuff. I don't know that I want to give up those hours. So in order to extricate myself from this commitment that I had made, unthinkingly, I went to talk to my dad, hoping that he would support me in my decision to step back from this. And so I was kind of going through, I didn't bring up the Mario Kart stuff with him, but I started going through it all, and I was like, I think maybe 18 or 19, maybe that's a little young to be, you know, leading this team and teaching, doing all this stuff. That, that seems a little young to me, maybe, maybe, maybe I should step back. I, I think in the back of my mind, I was kind of hoping he would take the team, and maybe I could be like an assistant coach or something. And so he interrupted me as I was telling the story, and he's like, okay, wait. So you were asked to be a coach in 10th inning kids this, this summer? I said, yes. He said, and you said, yes. I said, yes. And he's like, okay, what are we talking about here? <laughs> you have to do it. And so, of course, you know, I was like, okay, dad, all right, fine. I'm going to trudge out of the room, right? And so that's what I did. I did it. But here's the deal. Like I said, I, I didn't, like, make the decision for, for good mode. Let's just be honest. I was just ashamed to not do it at that point, okay? <laughs> so I went in just to avoid the shame of not being involved. I, I don't want to represent myself as, like, finally making the right decision. That's not really what happened. I was kind of forced into it by my circumstances, my own pride. Okay. I showed up at the first practice, and guess what? It was uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable. You pull up, and there's all these kids running around that somehow you have to wrangle and start teaching them something. And then you're going to give a, a devotion from the Bible, and their parents all gather around. And it was uncomfortable. But here's the deal. It was uncomfortable for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we started having a great time, and I got to build relationships with the parents. And it was super fun. 15 minutes, right, of discomfort. And, and, and you know, again, it, there was some discomfort after that, let's be honest. But the real true moments of being, like, uneasy... That lasted very, very briefly. And this is often the way it is in our lives. The discomforts of stepping out to follow the calling of Christ are fleeting. But the blessings last. Sometimes the blessings last eternally. Let me tell you about the blessings in my own life. Hopefully I was able to contribute something to this ministry and, and it could be a blessing to this community and this church. But the blessings in my life were significant. I got more involved at High Street. I got to build relationships with people I hadn't known previously at High Street. I got to dive into the Bible more seriously than I had before because I had to articulate it to people with a significant age range, and that takes work. So I got to dive into the Bible some more. I had accountability more as a part of being involved in this ministry. And on top of all of that, here's where it gets really good. I got to know someone that summer that I was a coach who about a year later, for reasons that remain mysterious to all involved, agreed to marry me. <laughs> so there you go. So that worked out really well. So I got all these, ble here's the deal, I almost missed out on all of those blessings of diving into the word and getting more serious in the Bible, getting more a part of this community at this church, which is a huge blessing to me, meeting my wife. I missed out on almost all of that because I was a little bit uncomfortable and I didn't really want to do that. If it had been up to me, I probably would have stepped back. But please remember, the discomforts that we face if we're called to do something different in the world, and there's going to be discomforts, they pass away but the blessings in our lives and the blessings in the lives of the people around us, they don't. Those blessings last. 
So let's not just go out there and avoid discomfort. In fact, if something's feeling a little bit uncomfortable, but it's something that you could be doing and that's good in the world, that's probably something you should be doing, leaning into what is uncomfortable for you. The final point today is this, we must be blessed to be a blessing. We receive God's blessing and then we bless others. Abram was blessed with a great nation. His name was made great in the world. He became known, of course, as Abraham. Became a great nation. He was blessed with that. And through that nation, great blessing came. He was blessed to be a blessing. The disciples, likewise, they were blessed to be a blessing. They were blessed with Jesus' presence, his mentorship, his teaching, and to some degree, his supernatural power and healing and in exorcism. They were blessed with all those things for the purpose, not simply of their own enjoyment, but to be a blessing. They were blessed to be a blessing. This is exactly what we are to do. Be blessed to be a blessing. A, a recent sermon series that really has resonated with me, I've been thinking about it a lot. It was from last year, November. Pastor already gave this series. It was about being grateful. And an important part of being grateful and cultivating gratitude in your life is taking time to take inventory of the good things that God is doing for you in your life right now. That helps us spiritually. It helps us mentally. Here's another thing it does. If we'll take inventory, if we'll write down the good things that God is doing in our lives, we can look at that list and we can say, okay, I'm blessed. Now how can I use these things to be a blessing? I'm blessed with a particular skill. How can I use that skill to help somebody? I'm blessed with time. How can I use that time to help somebody? I'm blessed with this resource, whether it's money or something else. How can I use that to bless other people? We go through the inventory of the good things in our life. We actually have to write them down. And we say, how can I be a blessing with the things in my life? And so I'd encourage you, if you kept a gratitude journal from late last year, to go through it and start thinking, how can I use these blessings to help somebody else? If you didn't do a gratitude journal, you can start one. Go through and write down the blessings in your life. Do it daily. And you can go through those blessings and think, how can I leverage these blessings to help the people around me in some way? I'll share another personal anecdote with you about a time that Steph and I, my wife and I, were blessed from the blessings of others. We had just moved to the UK, and I was going to be studying there. And for PhD students who were married, the university that I was at did not guarantee housing. And so we had to find our own housing. So we went and we got a hotel room for several days, and during that time, we were going to be house hunting. And we kind of thought it would be like in America, where you go and if you've got several days and you can get a credit check, you can get an apartment fairly quickly, and we, we thought it would be that way there. And then we thought if we had any problems, we could get assistance maybe from the university or something like that. Well, the university was out of rooms altogether. And after several days of house hunting in the UK, we discovered that actually it was going to take us probably a couple of weeks or more to secure housing. And so we didn't really have the money to stay in our hotel that long, so we were going to have to figure that out. And then the blow really was struck, and it was this. We got a call, or we called the hotel to, to extend our stay at the hotel, and they said, we've got some bad news. We actually don't have any rooms. There's no more rooms tonight, but we don't want to put you out on the curb, of course, and so we'll call other hotels in the area, and we'll find a place for you to stay. We said, thanks so much, and they went and started calling for us. We could have looked online, but our hotel didn't have the Internet, so we, like good Americans, had to go down to McDonald's to use the Internet. And so they were going to call for us and check on us. Well, we got a call back from them after a while, and they said, hey, we've got some bad news. We cannot find a hotel room in this region. And we thought, okay, what? There's not a hotel room in this region? And they said, there's not. We, we can't find a place for you to stay. And we were wondering about the reason, and they said, well, it's, it's because there's a big fight in town tonight, and so a bunch of people have come to town to see the fight. Now, we, we don't remember exactly what the fight was. I'm inclined to think that it was a mixed martial arts battle that was, that was happening. Steph thinks it was a uh, World Wrestling Federation, a WWF fight. In either case, hearing this news that we didn't have a place to stay was like getting punched by a muscular fighter. I'll, tell you, I'll say that much. I was the one who felt pummeled hearing this news because really we didn't know what to do. Now, some missionaries that we know who had worked with people in that area had been in touch with us and said, hey, we know some great people who work in that area. They are refugees from the Middle East and they are involved in Christian ministry in that area, and if you ever get in trouble, you can give them a call. And so Steph said, well, I think we need to call somebody. We don't have the internet. It would just be great if someone could like, look into the nearest area where there are hotels. And so Steph called one of the couples, and um, they, they were new to the area as well. So they were new to the area as well. They weren't quite sure, and so we called the other couple. Again, Middle Eastern refugees, didn't know them, 
And the man answers the phone, and Steph explains our situation, and the man says, hey, give me just a minute, and, and then we'll come back to you. So they hang up, he calls back, and he says, okay, I talked to my wife, just come stay with us, problem solved. And we thought, well, we don't really want to do that to strain. This is a very nice offer, but really, we're just wondering about, you know, accommodations in the area, maybe an area where we could catch a metro ride into the city, something like that, uh, if they know about any hostel, anything, if, just helping us to have knowledge or maybe helping us use the internet or something like that. But they said, no, 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 come stay with us. And so Steph objected a little bit, but they said, no, 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 it's very difficult to find a good place to live, and we want you to find a good place to live, so you need to come and stay with us. Just come stay with us. Complete strangers, by the way, that they invited to come stay with them. And so we went over to their house, and the man came out, and he grabbed some of our trunks, and I was <laughs> grabbing trunks too, and he, he moved us in, showed us around the house, we got to know him, and he said, stay here as long as you need. And it was a genuine, you could tell, this was a genuine offer, stay here as long as you need. It can be hard to find a good place to live around here. Stay here as long as you need. So we got to know them, and they were a huge blessing to us. You cannot even imagine the hospitality. I can go on and on about it, I won't. I could go on and on about the hospitality that they showed us, showed us around town, made us incredible meals, introduced us to their culture, showed us their ministry. An incredible blessing, an incredible humbling blessing that we received in our lives. And they told us later that the house that we were staying in had been gifted to them by someone who was aware of their ministry work and who wanted to encourage them and support them in some way. And so they got to stay in this house free of charge. And because they got to stay in that house, they viewed that house as a blessing that God had given them that they should be using for other people. And so when we called, I said, this is a house that God gave us. And there's some people who don't know what to do and they're trying to find a house. They need a roof over their heads. We're going to be blessed to be a blessing. And that's what they did. They took us in. We weren't the only ones, by the way, that they took in over those years. They would bring people in and put a roof over their heads. They were blessed to be a blessing. We gotta look at the blessings in our life. One of the blessings in our life is this church that we get to be a part of. And you know, the Easter season is coming up. And we've got the opportunity to share the blessing of being a part of this church with this community. We have the opportunity to bring people in and help them be a part of this community and receive the hope of Christ into their lives. Like I said, this is one of our great blessings here is this church and this, this community that we have. We shouldn't hold it to ourselves. We should be sharing it, inviting people to come and join us. Great time to do it is this upcoming Easter season. So let's take some moment now for introspection and reflection in our own lives as we think about responding to this general call of God. Again, if you're someone who's wondering about the call of God on your life, it starts with following this general call wherever you are. Wherever you are right now, whatever your situation is, call, following the general call that we've just talked about, to submit to God's leadership through taking action, being willing to step out of the comfort zone, and looking at how to bless other people with your own blessings. That's the general call. And as you follow that general call, as you maintain your relationship with God, the path before you is made clear. Now God, in general, when you look at the Bible and most of these stories, he's not telling you a long-range plan often. He's just giving you a little bit at a time. But as you respond to the general call, you can be sure that you can be following him step by step. So here's what we need to think to ourselves, and here's what we need to ask of ourselves today. First of all, those of us who are Christians, who are following Christ, are we followers who are agreeers primarily? Or are we action takers? Are we ones standing back and watching Jesus' path and watching him walk the path, but we're not walking and we're saying, yeah, that's a good path to walk, I agree. But we're not actually walking it? Probably most of us in some areas of our lives are agreeers and not action takers. What are those areas in your life? Jesus is saying to you, follow me. Follow me, take action, submit to my leadership. Next question, is comfort keeping you from doing something good in the world? Is there something good that you could be doing in the world that you know you should be doing in the world? Maybe the Holy Spirit's bringing it to your mind even now. Is there something you could be doing in the world but you're not doing it because it makes you uncomfortable? Is there some goodness that you have that you could be sharing with others, some work that you could be doing, but comfort has become an idol, and you're not willing to be uncomfortable? Next question. How has God blessed you recently? How has God blessed you recently? I hope some things are coming to mind. Now let me ask you this. How could you leverage those blessings to bless somebody else? What can you do tomorrow? 
What can you do in the coming week, in the coming month, to take the things God has blessed you with so that you can be blessed to be a blessing? These are the questions. As I said a moment ago, taking action in the world under God's leadership, being uncomfortable, it's hard to do. It's hard to do. Being blessed to be a blessing, you know, our inclination is to keep the blessings, right? We want to keep them. We don't want to give them away. This is hard. That's why we need God's help. We need to be following him, have a relationship with him. So let's go to him now in prayer as a group and ask for God's help and his power in our lives so that we can answer this call with a yes. Lord, we come to you and we thank you for calling us. It's an incredible privilege and we, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to follow and answer the call to follow you and be a different type of person in the world. We pray that you would help us to be not simply agreeers but action takers. We pray that comfort wouldn't be our idol. We pray that you would help us to see our blessings as things that we can use to bless others. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I want to talk to one other, one other group of people here, and those are people who are here, who are at home, who never before have answered the call to follow Christ at all. I want to talk to you right now because it's very simple. To become a follower of Christ, to have your sins forgiven, to have assurance of eternal life, all you have to do is say yes. He's calling you. The resurrected Christ is there. He's calling and he's saying, follow me. And all you have to do is say yes to him. I want to follow you. So if you've never done that before, I want to invite you to do that today. It's start an incredible journey. And all of us who are here who've said yes, all of us would be very happy to tell you it's the best decision we ever made, saying yes to this call to follow Christ. You don't have to do anything other than accept the call, accept Christ in your life, and follow him. If that's you, let me ask you to pray with me right now. Lord, I believe in you. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins, were buried, rose again. I come to you and I ask that you would come into my life and I want to follow you now. I want to turn away from the destructive behaviors in my life. I want to follow you now. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, we believe you've been born again and you're about to start this incredible journey of a relationship with God. And we want to help you in that journey. We want you to be a part of the community here or wherever you are, wherever you're watching. And so we want to help you with that. And so we can help you if you'll text the word prayed to 94,000. We can get in touch with you and we can help out. So Jesus is calling us all today, no matter where we are in our lives. He's calling us all. Let's say yes. Hey, thanks so much for joining us for church today. If you made any decisions, we would love to hear from you. Text PRAYED to 94000 and we'd love to celebrate with you. We'll see you next time.